Hi, I'm Andrew Clavin, and this is my new story, Another Kingdom, performed by Michael Knowles. In the last episode, Austin Lively, a failed Hollywood nobody working as a lowly book reader for Mythos Production Company, walks through a door and finds himself in a locked room in a castle tower. A woman lies stabbed to death on the floor, and a bloody dagger is in Austin's hands. Soldiers break down the door, knock Austin senseless, and throw him into a dungeon cell with a roaring ogre hungry for blood. They leave him there alone. Another Kingdom, Episode 2. Darkness. The ogre went on screaming his squealy scream, his chains rattling. I cowered wild-eyed against the rough wall, praying I would wake up. Because this had to be a dream, it had to be. The moments went by with intolerable slowness. The stench was suffocating. So was the helplessness. So was the fear. But after a while, I don't know how long, the darkness seemed to have an effect on the monster. His roars began to subside. The clanking of his chains grew intermittent. Finally, with a last low growl, he fell quiet. I heard him settling on the floor with a huff. My eyes had begun to adjust now. The darkness I saw was not utterly dark. The torches from the dungeon corridors sent a faint, shivering glow through the square opening in the cell door. Soon I could make out the shape of the monster. I could see him sitting against the opposite wall. I saw his huge eye blink and then sink slowly shut. His great head tilted forward. His chin came to rest on his chest. He began to snore. It was a sound like the bowels of the earth shifting. For the first time since I had come here, I had a moment of relative quiet, relative peace. I tried to breathe. I tried to calm myself. I had to think. I had to figure out where I was, what I could do. I ran my hands over my clothing. Did I have my phone with me? My keys? Something I could use to call for help or to pry off these manacles? But no, these weren't my clothes at all. Not the clothes I'd been wearing when, a few minutes ago, when I was in the hall at Global Studios. I was wearing some sort of vest, suede it felt like, and leggings of rough cloth, no pockets, no pouch, nothing I could use to get out of here. Frustrated, I looked around, squinting to try and see through the shadows. And now, with a small shock, I realized for the first time that there was someone else here, someone besides the monster. There was another man sitting in the corner to my right. He was chained to the wall, too. I could see the links rising from his nearest wrist to the ring above and behind him. The longer I stared, the clearer I saw him. A starved, half-naked creature with long, dirty black hair. His head hung down. His hair dangled, obscuring his face. I thought he must be asleep, like the monster. But then, as if he felt my eyes on him, he looked up, looked at me. Even in that darkness, I could see the tears glistening in his eyes and on his cheeks. Then he lowered his face again. His body shuddered. I could hear him weeping. Hey, I whispered. I glanced at the ogre. I didn't want to wake the thing. But when the man just went on crying, I whispered louder, Hey! The man lifted his head again, lifted it slowly as if it were a great weight. What is this place? I asked him. Where the hell am I? He only stared at me as if he couldn't understand the question. I don't know where I am, I said. Tell me, please. He had to work to speak. His voice was hopeless, thick with tears. He answered as if I ought to already know. It's Eastrum, the castle dungeon. Eastrum? In California? Are we in California? And when he was silent again, where is Eastrum? I've never heard of it. It's the council seat of Galliana, on the border of the Eleven Lands. This sounded so absurd. The Eleven Lands, like something out of a second-rate sword and sorcery novel. I thought at first maybe he was being sarcastic. But then this whole place, dungeons, ogres, men with swords. It was all sword and sorcery stuff. 
I opened my mouth to ask more. But I didn't ask more. I didn't say anything. I just stood there, my mouth still open. Galliana. Isn't that what he said? Galliana. My mouth closed slowly. I licked my lips, thinking, thinking. Something had stirred in my memory. Galliana. I knew that name. I'd heard of that place before. Somewhere. Where? I couldn't remember. Galliana, I said aloud. But now the man lowered his head back down. He made an awful noise and began sobbing again. Where is Galliana? I asked him. Oh, please, 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 was all he said, sobbing. Please. I wasn't going to get more out of him, not for a while. I scanned the cell to see if there was anyone else here. No one. Just the monster, still sleeping, still snoring, and the sobbing man. Suddenly, I was aware how weary I was, how heavy I felt, as if the weight of all this craziness was just now sinking down on top of me. I lowered myself to the floor, propped myself against the wall. The thick shit stench of the place was even thicker down here. It made my gorge rise and my stomach roll. I wanted to stand up out of it, but I was too tired, exhausted. My head continued to pulse with pain. I put my hand to the sore spot and flinched. I felt dried blood, skin scraped raw on a bump the size of a fist. I squeezed my eyes shut against the throbbing ache of the wound. I leaned my head back against the stone. Galliana, I thought. Where had I heard that word before? Maybe, if I could remember, I might begin to make some sense of this. Maybe. What seemed like a moment later, I quickly lifted my head. It had fallen forward. I realized I'd been asleep. How long, I didn't know. But something had woken me. What was it? With a jolt of fear, I thought, the monster. Maybe he'd woken up. Maybe he'd gotten free. But I located him in the dark, still on the floor, curled up on his side now, still snoring. The emaciated man in the corner to my right also seemed to have fallen asleep. What had woken me up then? I scanned the dark cell. Everything was still. Then, wait, yes. Out of the corner of my eye, I had seen something for a moment, but it was gone now. I stared at the spot. Seconds went by. Then there it was again, a dim, colorful flash, a strange, motley, sparkling, very brief, there and gone. I leaned forward, peering at the place where the flash had been. It took a while, but finally I made out a figure, a silhouette, a shadow there. My stomach turned. It was some sort of animal, something like a rat, but huge, the size of a small dog. It was sitting not two feet away from me, just sitting, just gazing at me. I could see the glint of its eyes. My chains rattled as I drew back from the thing, but a few seconds later it happened again. That dim, sparkling, multicolored flash of light, white, red, yellow, blue, green, and golden particles of illumination flew off the creature like confetti. I gave a little gasp of amazement and disgust. In the momentary glow I saw that the rodent had a human face, a woman's face, bizarre and haunting on that animal body. A second later, the dancing sparks of light winked out and the rodent, or whatever it was, dropped back into the shadows again. My mouth had gone stone dry. I had to lick my lips before I could speak. And should I speak to a thing like that? But I did. I said, What are you? What do you want? But before she had time to answer, if she could answer, footsteps sounded on the dungeon stairs. I turned quickly toward the door. I heard a shout. Jailer, I'm here for the heretic! The emaciated man in the corner bolted upright, fully awake. Oh, God! He screamed. He scrambled to his feet, his chain clanking. The monster stirred, too, grumbling. I looked toward him, then looked toward the girl rodent. But she was gone. She had vanished. There were noises now all around me. The jailer's door creaking open. The emaciated man in the corner mewling to himself. No, no! The ogre chained to the opposite wall, snuffed and huffed and lumbered to its feet. Ah, oh, shit, I said. Footsteps were coming to the cell door. Torchlight coming through the opening, the key in the lock, 
the hollow thunk. God forgive me, help me, wailed the emaciated man, and the monster, the ogre, went wild again, roaring its high-pitched roar, rattling its chains, straining to break free. Frightened, I leapt up. I tried to press my body through the stone of the wall behind me to get away from the monster. The monster went on shrieking. The emaciated man, the heretic in the corner, started whimpering. Please, God. He was in an agony of terror. The door chunked open. The ogre roared louder. The heretic cowered and wept. The jailer stood just outside the cell doorway, holding his torch. And into the cell came a figure of fear. I knew at once he was an executioner. What else could he be? Dressed in a robe of midnight black? his head completely covered by a black mask with holes in it for his mouth and nose and eyes. They were eyes that expressed a brisk professionalism, jovial, contented, and merciless. I could see the same professionalism in his rolling gait and in his bare, blunt, powerful, cruel, white hands. Here was a man who was happy in his work and good at it. He strolled jauntily into the cell and two husky guards strode in behind him. The jailer skittered in last, his beaked nose protruding from his cowl, his bug eyes red with flame. The heretic fell to his knees, his hands clasped in front of him. Mercy, mercy, he cried. My eyes flashed here and there in confusion and panic. The ogre went on squealing and struggling. For the second time, I saw dust fly up from the rings that anchored its chains to the wall. I thought I saw one of those rings wobble, loosening, but in the unsteady flame light, with all the din and fear, I couldn't be sure. Mercy! The heretic cried again. The executioner laughed. Not cruelly, I thought, but just because the prisoner's pleas struck him as amusingly predictable, like a child's whining at bedtime. You might want to save your screaming, heretic, he said. You'll have plenty to scream about soon enough. Take him. This last was to the guards. They moved forward at once and seized hold of the emaciated man. He howled and struggled wildly, threw himself on the floor, clawing the dirt, trying to hold on. But the guards were skilled and swift. They pushed quickly past his flailing limbs, detached his bonds from the wall. Then, holding a length of chain like a leash, one of them dragged the prisoner, kicking and screaming, across the floor and out of the cell. The whole operation took less than a minute, with the ogre roaring all the while. The executioner glanced at me where I stood crouched and gaping against the wall. It was a professional glance, I thought, assessing me as his next project. It made my heart go hollow. Well, he said to me then with friendly wave, have a pleasant evening and he pivoted back on his heel and strode out as jauntily as he'd come. The jailer lingered only another moment to harass the monster with a few last passes of his torch. His sadistic giggles were drowned by the ogre's frenzied cries. Stop it, you idiot! I shouted. Because this time, as the ogre struggled, I was certain I saw the ring in the wall start to wiggle out of its moorings. The jailer gave another nasty laugh and walked out, shutting the door behind him. Again, there was darkness. And again, the ogre raved and strained and his chains rattled. I cowered against the wall, waiting for him to break free, to leap across the shadows and rip my head off with a single bite of those massive jaws. Christ, would I even see him coming? But again, slowly, he settled down. The roaring subsided. He sank to the floor once more and began to snore. About 20 minutes later, the shrieking started. I'd heard the expression before, my blood ran cold, but I never experienced it, not like this. Those shrieks, that uncanny sound, it was not like any other sound I had ever heard, ever. It made my breath short, it made my balls tighten, and yes, it made my blood feel icy in my veins. Somewhere deep in the belly of this nightmare place, the heretic was being tortured. That jolly professional executioner was doing unimaginable things to him with expert skill. I knew this because the victim's cries of agony were coming through I don't know how many levels of thick stone 
and reaching me where I was as loud as if the man were right beside me. Jesus, Jesus, I whispered. My flesh was all bumps and tremors. It wasn't as if I could feel the pain, but I remembered the executioner's glance and I could feel my vulnerability to pain, how easily what was being done to the heretic could be done to me. Even the ogre stirred and muttered uneasily in his sleep. The shrieking went on and on and on and unbelievably on, a kind of torture in itself, a mental battering. You would have thought the poor bastard would lose his voice. You would have thought he would lose consciousness. You would have thought he would die, just for God's sake, die. But the executioner must have known every trick, every method to make the man suffer and yet keep him alive. Assaulted by that noise, I sank down onto the floor again. I curled my body up and pressed my hands to my ears to try to block it out. It didn't help at all. There was no blocking out those wails of agony. They were in my mind now, rising out of the blackest part of my imagination. On and on and on. They shrouded me, an acid shroud that ate away at whatever courage I had, whatever hope I had, whatever faith I had. What was happening to me? How had I gotten here? Was I going to die here, like this, like him, tortured, executed, or ripped to pieces by a beast who couldn't even exist? What was this place? Was I crazy? Or was I crazy before, back in LA? Was my real life some sort of dream? Was this hell reality? I curled on the floor, holding my ears, squeezing my eyes shut. The heretic's shrieks went on and on and on. A tear ran down my cheek and fell into the dust on the dungeon floor. What happened next happened with shocking quickness. I must have slept again. It was a small mercy anyway. Suddenly the cell door came crashing in. Suddenly the ogre was roaring again. Suddenly there were men in the cell, two guards and that other man, the black bearded man in the red vest with the gold dragon on it, the man who had struck me down. Suddenly the jailer was back with his torch held high and his hideous warty face cracked open in a grin. Groggy, confused, I was on my feet. The guards came at me and grabbed me freed me from the chains in the wall and wrenched my arms behind me. The man in the dragon vest stood directly in front of me, his eyes on mine, mine held by his. He had his sword in his hand and I knew if I struggled he'd strike me down on the spot. So I just stood there while the guards manacled my wrists behind my back. Over the roars of the ogre, over the rattling of his chains, the man in the dragon vest said in a voice of perfect calm, it's time for your trial, Lively. Then the guards grabbed my arms. The man in the dragon vest strolled out of the cell. The guards hustled me after him. I was forced to cross the threshold. And the next thing I knew, I was standing in the stairwell at Global Studios, the world swirling around me. I reeled where I stood. The stairwell seemed to tilt and spin. I clutched my chest, swallowing hard, fighting down the urge to vomit. I felt myself stagger toward the edge of the steps. I reached out blindly for the wooden banister, felt it, grabbed it, held on with both hands to keep from falling over. It took me a second or two to catch my breath, to get my bearings. Then my eyes ranged around the space. Was it possible? It was, the nightmare, the hallucination, whatever it had been, it was over. Gripping the banister, I bent double. I let out a gasp of relief. What the actual fuck, I said, and for a moment I was giddy with joy. I laughed out loud. But then, the moment after that, I thought, no, really, what the fuck? I lifted my head. My vision was blurred with emotion. What just happened? The only answer I could come up with was that there had to be something wrong with me, wrong with my brain, a tumor or something. Because that, what just happened? That was so insane, and so insanely real, too. The whole thing, the dead woman on the floor, and the dungeon, and the ogre, and the shrieking heretic. It hadn't been like a dream at all. It was like I was there, like it was really happening. That couldn't be normal, could it? That was brain tumor stuff for sure. Still, it was over. For now, at least. That was something, anyway. 
because so help me, that ogre was about to pull those chains out of the wall. I was sure of it. <laughs> I laughed again, just once. Ogre, I muttered. Listen to me. Talking like there were ogres. Like there could really be ogres outside of a fairy tale or a movie or something. Still, I couldn't believe how real it had all seemed. I started down the stairs. I kept a good, firm hold on the banister. My legs felt weak and unsteady, but with every step, the dizziness and nausea were receding. By the time I reached bottom, I could feel the strength returning to my limbs. I pushed through the door, out onto the ground floor of the Edison building. There, at the end of the hall, were the glass doors to the lot outside. The blessed California sun was shining through them. The blessed blue California sky was visible above the rounded roofs of the sound stages. I made my way to the doors quickly. I pushed out and took in a great big beautiful breath of the autumn air. How fresh it was, how free, blowing away the stench of the dungeon, the shit and despair, erasing the memory of the manacles on my wrist, dispersing the suffocating fog of helplessness, confusion and terror that had surrounded me. I hurried across the lot to my car, trying to gather my thoughts, trying to make some sense of what had happened. I would have to go to the doctor, I figured, get some tests, maybe a brain scan, a thing like this. It couldn't be normal, could it? A hallucination that realistic. It was cause to worry, wasn't it? It was, I knew it was, and yet with every step, the entire bizarre experience seemed to be receding into a distant unreality. I glanced at my watch. It didn't seem as if any time had passed from the moment I stepped into that tower room where the dead woman lay to the moment I returned to the stairwell. The whole nightmare had come and gone in an instant. So whatever had caused it, how bad could it really be? By the time my battered Nissan came into view in its parking space, I was beginning to talk myself out of even my lingering anxieties. Maybe this little sword and sorcery fantasy of mine had just been some sort of harmless brain glitch, some little frizz of neural static. I was never a big drug guy, but I'd smoked a joint from time to time. The last one was more than a year ago, but who knows? Maybe the dope had backed up on me somehow, caused a flash of dendritic weirdness, a sort of mental belch. I continued across the studio lot. I saw people stare at me as I went by. I saw the way they frowned and narrowed their eyes. But I didn't really notice it. I didn't notice anything. I was too lost in my own thoughts. I reached my car. I pulled the door open. I sank into the driver's seat, started the engine, glanced up into the rear view mirror to check for traffic behind me. And I saw myself. The shock of it was like a blow to the chest. It seemed to stop my heart and knock the breath right out of me. I stared at my reflection in the rear view mirror, my eyes wide and white and full of horror. The side of my face was smeared with dried blood. On my forehead was the purple knot with the split skin running across it, the wound I had felt with my fingers in the dungeon, the wound I had gotten when the man in the dragon vest had struck me with the flat of his sword and knocked me senseless. It was there, the wound. It was real. I looked at my hands. They were covered in dust. There were faint blue bruises around my wrists where the manacles had been. I looked up into the mirror again, my mouth open. The blood, the wound, they were real. It was all real. The dead woman, the dungeon, the ogre roaring in his chains. It had really happened. As my mind raced, I heard a whispered word break from my lips. Galliana. I drove unsteadily back toward Noho. I was fighting panic now. My thoughts were going in circles trying to make sense of something that just did not make sense. I kept looking at my reflection in the rearview mirror, hoping the wound and the blood would be gone, gone like the dungeon and all the rest, another hallucination. But they were still there, always still there. And now that I knew they were there, my head began to throb and ache again. I began to feel weak and dizzy, maybe from the blow, maybe just from the shock and confusion. I parked my jalopy in the garage under my apartment building, but I didn't go up to my apartment. I didn't want to be alone there, staring into the bathroom mirror, desperately trying to understand what could not be understood. Instead, I hurried back to Hitchcock's. And now I did notice the faces of the people who looked at me, 
the way they started and stared when I staggered past them on the sidewalk. All I could think was that they didn't know the half of it. For all they knew, I could have gotten this wound falling against the curb or walking into a door. What if I told them how it had really happened? It was quiet at Hitchcock's, the hour between breakfast and lunch. There was only a handful of stubble-chinned writer types sitting behind their laptops at the sidewalk tables. I scanned their faces. There was no one I knew. None of them even looked up from his work as I stumbled past them to the door. I pushed inside the cafe. I saw at once my usual table was empty. All of my friends had gone off to work or whatever it was they did all day. There were just a couple of yoga class girls having coffee in one corner, their rolled up mats leaning against the wall. An out of work actor reading a paperback behind the bar. A protest of some kind was on the news on TV. People shouting, raising their fists, the volume low. It was quiet here, very quiet. My heart sank. No friends, no one to turn to, no one to help me. Then Skylar Cohen shot out of the kitchen like a cannonball. She looked enormous as always, stuffed into her black t-shirt, and angry as always with her red hair spiking off her head like a flame. She was carrying a plate with a sandwich on it. She saw me and the plate dropped from her fingers and shattered on the floor. She practically carried me to her car, a colorless old Ford of some sort, plunked me into the passenger seat, and drove me back to her house, which was really Jane Janeway's house, cursing at me the whole time. Because she didn't like men, but she liked me, but she didn't like me because she liked Jane, who didn't like her, or not in that way, and she didn't think it was fair the way men got women to take care of them, but something in me brought that out in her, which a lot of times actually made me uncomfortable, because it annoyed her so much, but right at the moment I was very grateful for. It was complicated. What did you do to yourself, you stupid asshole? She said, glancing from the road to me. Did you get into some macho ape fight? You did, didn't you? If you did, so help me, I will fuck you up. You understand me? You will rue the day, Austin. I'm serious. This, from Skylar, was tender loving care. I leaned against the passenger window, weak and sick, letting the warmth of her affection wash over me. It was a lot of affection. Twenty minutes of insults and obscenities. Jane's house was in Los Feliz, near Griffith Park, a beautiful Spanish colonial manse with yellow walls and a red-tiled roof and all sorts of towers and chimneys rising into the branches of the surrounding oaks. The house belonged to Dave Exus, really, her movie star employers. It was one of their smaller properties around town. They let her live there so they could all the more easily call on her services 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Skylar parked in the driveway. I got out of the car, but she rushed around to grab hold of me as if I were about to collapse. I can walk, I said. Shut up, she explained, and she gripped me hard, holding me upright as we went together toward the house. I was glad she did. Between the head wound and the insanity of it all, I really was pretty sick and dizzy by now. I drew strength and comfort from leaning against the generous feminine softness of her. She knew it, too. She pressed me tightly against one enormous breast, though if I'd said it out loud, she would have beaten me senseless. Jane, she bellowed as she pushed through the door and hauled me in with her. Between this and being dragged around the dungeons of Galliana by prison guards, I felt I hadn't taken two steps on my own all day. We came into a hallway hung with colorful Spanish mosaics and paved with elegant Spanish tiles. Jane! When she wasn't picking up Dave Exus's dry cleaning or shopping for their furniture or driving them from place to place or listening to them complain or helping them pick out their wardrobe, Jane was often home during the day, working on her computer, making their appointments, answering their email, and arranging their travel. I got the impression Dave Exus had two lives, the glamorous movie star life they lived and the life of everyday drudgery that Jane lived for them. She came out of her home office into the front hall and saw me in Skylar's arms, a wounded warrior carried off the field. She was wearing one of her shapeless sweatshirts and track pants to hide her loveliness from her employers even now when they were nowhere near. And yet the look on her face was so full of compassion, so full of the feminine tenderness Skylar felt but couldn't show, that it pierced through even my panic and confusion, and I saw that Mousy Jane was really beautiful. For the first time I wondered, down deep, only just above the level of panicking consciousness. 
what would it be like to actually earn the kind of devotion that her movie star bosses merely paid for? The two girls helped me into what I guess was a guest room, a small rectangular space with nothing but a single bed and a writing desk and chair in it, plus a window onto a pleasantly weedy little garden out back. Jane took my shoes off while Skylar lay me down on the mattress, my head on a fluffy pillow. Then Skylar fetched a washcloth and brought it to Jane. Jane sat beside me and cleaned my wound, fussing over me with a womanly care that made me yearn up into her blue-green eyes. Skylar, meanwhile, leaned darkly against the door, looking jealous of me for being with Jane and jealous of Jane for being the Jane-like way Skylar could never bring herself to be. "'What did you do to yourself, sweetheart?' Jane asked me, swabbing the wound. "'He got into a fight,' said Skylar, gruffly from the doorway. "'I didn't get in a fight,' I said. "'What did you do?' asked Jane. "'What could I say? "'That I'd been bodily swept off into some fantasy movie? "'Locked in a castle dungeon with an ogre in the imaginary land of Galliana? "'I tripped and fell off the curb at the studio. "'Smacked my head on the pavement,' I said. "'Oh, Austin!' "'I didn't like lying to her, but I liked the pity in her voice. "'I loved the pity. "'I drank the pity down like a healing elixir.' How soft they were, those blue-green eyes. She wrung the washcloth out in a small bowl. She examined her work, my head. The cut's not so bad. I don't think you need stitches or anything. It's just a bad bump, really. And so help me as I live, she leaned down and kissed it lightly. To make it better, you know. And so help me as I live. It did make it better. It made me feel better anyway. She was full of magic yin, our Jane, and all I could think was what a shame it was, what a waste to spend that supernatural girl power on a couple of movie stars who wouldn't even notice if their limo backed over her. A man of spirit, on the other hand, might live and die to make her proud and happy. From the corner of my eye, I saw Skylar avert her glance from the two of us, wincing with emotional pain. Then I heard, we all heard, the phone ringing in the home office, Dave Exus calling Jane with one of their endless demands. And yet she didn't leave me, not right away. I want you to rest here a little, all right, until you feel stronger. The phone rang again. She stood up off the bed. Are you hungry? Do you need something to eat? I shook my head weakly, gazing up at her, mesmerized. All right, I'll make you some soup in a while. Just get some rest. She lingered to smile down at me, but the phone kept insisting. At last, she hurried away. I glanced over at Skylar. Skylar rolled her eyes and shook her head in disgust, then peeled off the doorway and disappeared down the hall. Alone then, I lay where I was. Jane had worked her wonders on me. Everything that had been frantic inside me was quiet now. Everything that had been sore was soothed and easy. I turned my head on the pillow to glance out the window at the pale green tangle of garden framed in the pane. For the first time since my return to reality, or my return to Los Angeles at least, which was as close to reality as I was going to get, I was able to think things over with a measure of calm. What had happened to me? This journey to Galliana, what was it? If it was just a hallucination, how had it left its mark on me? I didn't just mean the bruise on my head either, it was more than that. The shock of my arrest, the fear of the ogre, the sympathetic agony that had curdled my skin as I listened to the shrieks of the tortured heretic. All that had scarred me too. If nothing else, I couldn't help but notice it had taken me out of myself a little, given me some emotional distance from my current Hollywood setbacks and irritations. In fact, I hardly felt them at all anymore. Even if Galliana was an illusion, that mark remained, same as the knot on my forehead. Galliana. Where had I heard that name before? Gentled by Jane's gentleness, I let my eyes sink shut. I woke from a fine, deep sleep, still peaceful, more peaceful than I had felt in what seemed like a long time. I had been so troubled for such a while, these many weeks at least, the long, quietly frantic wait to hear back from my agent about my new script, the hollow nausea of knowing the script was bad, the crushing grief 
That's what it was, the grief of having him reject me. The spiraling emptiness of feeling that the dream of my life was over, that I was not going to be what I wanted to be, but was going to be nothing more than what I was right now. And then, walking through that stairwell door, Galeana. Where had I heard that name? I went into the pocket of my jeans and fished out my phone. Still lying down, I held it up above me, working the keyboard with my thumbs. I brought up the OG search engine and tapped in the word, Galeana. There were over a million hits. It was both a first name and a last name and the name of several locations. Up at the top of the results, there was a Wikipedia entry. I clicked on that. It was a disambiguation page, a page giving all the various listings for the word. Galeana may refer to a town in Punjab, Pakistan, a princess in Moorish Spain, a fictional country in the novel Another Kingdom by Ellen Evermore. The moment I reached the end of the entry, I felt a jolt of recognition. Another kingdom, I whispered to myself. Yes, I knew that book, or at least I've heard of it. But when? Where? I read so many books as a story analyst for Mythos, I couldn't remember all of them, yet I felt sure I'd seen that title somewhere among them. There was no link to any Wikipedia entry for the book, so I called up Amazon and searched for it there. Sure enough, they had it listed. Another Kingdom by Ellen Evermore. Murder and political intrigue stalk the dangerous halls of Castle Eastrum in the New Republic of Galliana. There it was! Excited, I sat up quickly, too quickly. The room tilted and I felt dizzy and sick again. Woo, I said. Slowly, I lay back down. I reread the page. Eastrum, in Galliana. Wasn't that exactly what the heretic had told me in the dungeon? Yes, it was. I scrolled over the site some more, but surprisingly, there was nothing else to find. There should have been a longer description of the book, but there wasn't. There should have been a picture of the book's cover, but there was only an empty square containing the words, no image. There were no reviews, no links to other sellers, only a notice that said, this book is not available at this time. Not available? Anywhere? On the whole internet? Not available at all? Moving cautiously, I turned onto my side and propped myself up on my elbow to get in a better position to work the phone. I searched other sites, auction sites, used book sites. I ran a general search for the novel's title. It led me back to Amazon. That was it. I bit the corner of my lip. Strange, no? A book you couldn't find online? When the hell does that happen? I took a breath, trying to come up with a fresh search tactic, and I thought, my coverage. Sure, if I'd read the book for Mythos, I would have written a report. I tried my e-reader, but there was nothing there, which didn't mean much. To preserve space, I usually moved coverage I no longer needed into a local file in my laptop. I needed to get home and look for that coverage. My hunting blood was up now. Something weird had happened to me. Something very weird. Mega weird. The hallucination or dream or whatever it was. The head wound. And now a novel with the place names Galliana and Eastrum in it, just like in the dream. It felt like I was close to finding an explanation for my experience. Close and yet impossibly far, because I couldn't imagine what explanation there could be. But whatever it was, I wanted to find out. Needed to. Another Kingdom by Ellen Evermore. I needed to get home and find that coverage. This has been Another Kingdom by Andrew Claven, performed by Michael Knowles. <laughs>